Thank you for a kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be able to present this webinar that produced by Fertility and Genomic Solutions. The main focus of this webinar will be on tips and tricks for successful vitrification protocols. Here are the contents of the presentation. So first of all, we will talk about the basic principles of cryopreservation. Then we will point out how to manage expectations, the education process and evaluation of the results using key performance indicators implemented in your lab. We will go through traceability and witnessing as it's one of the most important topics nowadays, especially because of the increasing number of PGT cycles and the movements of the samples from clinic to clinic. And then we will talk about tips and tricks that can help you to improve your results. And finally, we will summarize the key points. So let's start with the definitions and different areas of using cryopreservation procedures in RT programs. Cryopreservation is a process that allows us to stop the cell's metabolism by exposing them to high concentrations of cryoprotectants, store them at low temperatures, and maintain their viability. Freezing and storage of human tissues and cells is carried out at minus 196 degrees Celsius in liquid nitrogen in order to preserve them for future use. At these low temperatures, there are no physiological activities. According to some publications, cells and tissues can be stored almost indefinitely. Cryopreservation is not an artificial process and can be found in vivo as well. This is a picture of an Alaskan wood frog, which can tolerate the freezing of its blood and other tissues. Urea is accumulated in its tissues in preparation for cold weather and winter. In response to internal ice formation, liver glycogen is converted in large quantities to glucose. Both urea and glucose act as cryoprotectants to limit the amount of ice that forms and to reduce the osmotic shrinkage of the cells. But let's come back to RT. Cryopreservation is a widely used method in modern RT and the areas of its usage have increased over the last decade due to implementation of a number of new techniques. Basically, we do cryopreservation to preserve fertility in the case of diseases, donor programs, and for social reasons, such as delaying fertility. We have to freeze samples in the case of unforeseen events. In some cases, embryologists are faced with the situation when a semen sample cannot be produced on the day of the pickup. Thus, we have to vitrify the oocytes for the next cycle. We have to have a very well-established vitrification procedure before we start PGT protocols in the clinic, as especially for the day five biopsy protocol, embryo transfer cannot be performed in a fresh cycle and blastocysts are vitrified. And of course, we do cryopreservation to optimize results as it was shown that you can increase the clinical outcomes. Nowadays, we can cryopreserve human gametes and embryos at all pre-implantation stages of development, as well as ovarian and testicular tissues. There is some evidence in favor of using vitrification for oocyte freezing. Oocyte vitrification is a widely used procedure now in the case of absence of the sperm cells on the day of pickup for oocyte pooling, social freezing, and for donor programs. Embryons can be cryopreserved with the same outcomes by using either slow freezing or vitrification, but for blastocyst, vitrification seems to be a preferable technique. Mostly we cryopreserve embryos and blastocysts in freeze-all cycles when we have surplus good quality embryos and for PGT cycles. Sperm cells uh, can be cryopreserved with the same results by both methods in the case of disease, preparation for IVF treatment, or for donor programs. Testicular and ovarian tissue cryopreservation is an actively developing area within IVF, mostly due to delaying of reproduction in the case of disease or to alleviate the menopause. There are two main methods of cryopreservation of human gametes, embryos, and tissues that have been used in RT laboratories for the past few decades, slow freezing and vitrification. 
Both of these techniques are based on the principle of dehydration. Slow freezing involves freezing of the samples in a controlled slow decrease of the temperature environment with a slow increase of the osmolality around the embryos and requires a rather expensive rate controlled freezer. You can see the temperature profile of slow freezing in the blue line here. Vitrification allows the solidification of the cells into a glass-like structure without forming ice crystals. Vitrification requires very high cooling rate that can be achieved by immediate plunging of the embryos into liquid nitrogen and a much higher concentration of cryoprotectants compared to slow freezing. You can see the temperature profile of vitrification in red line here. Although these two methods differ, they allow us to ensure a high survival rate and the viability of human embryos. Lauro Rienz and colleagues showed that the contribution of cryopreservation to the cumulative life birth rate in Europe in 2011 was around 4%. We can assume that this figure has increased in recent years because of pre-implantation genetic screening and freeze-all cycles. So, the importance of an efficient cryopreservation program in the clinic is crucial as it gives a lot of benefits such as application of an elective aeuploid embryo transfer to reduce the miscarriage rate, provides the opportunity to perform cycle segmentation, extends time for embryo evaluation, enables egg banking for donation and for oocyte accumulation, permits fertility preservation and finally enhances the cumulative life birth rate per oocyte retrieval cycle. Let's concentrate on vitrification. As already touched, the basis of the process of vitrification allows us to cryopreserve cells by bringing them into a glass-like structure without any ice crystal formation that can be detrimental for embryo viability. The high efficiency of the vitrification program should be maintained at all times to achieve high rates of success. According to many publications, vitrification is more effective than standard slow freezing for mostly all stages of embryo development, resulting in the doubling of the pregnancy rates. Because of the high efficiency of vitrification, there are a lot of available commercial kits and vitrification devices that vary between different laboratories. Commercial vitrification kits are similar in composition and protocols, even though they may appear different. Vitrification is a two-step procedure that requires the placement of samples from the drop with equilibration media to another one with vitrification media. Here are two examples of popular protocols used with success for embryos. The main difference between different commercial protocols is the number of vitrification drops that vary from 1 to 4 and the recommended volume. Some kits, for example, the Sage Vitrification Kit, offer flexibility to use the volume from 0.1 to 1 ml, while others are restricted to recommendations of 20, 50 or 300 microliters drops. Small volumes work in some hands, but safety and consistency grow with volume. A minimum of 300 microliters is a recommended volume as it has proven successful in popular commercial kits. Ensure your results are satisfactory and consistent with a 300 microliters drop of equilibration solution before an attempt to reduce volume, then evaluate the effect. The total duration of exposure to the vitrification solutions and loading of the vitrification carrier must not exceed the maximum time stated in the IFU. It worth mentioning that volumes of the equilibration and vitrification media are crucial for the vitrification process. Here is our internal data regarding the weight loss during the equilibration step with different volumes of the solution. Blue lines represent a 15 minutes equilibration of a blastocyst. As you can see, drop size will affect evaporation and consequently consistency of the environment surrounding the gamete on embryo. Ideally, each cryo case should be treated the same way in terms of time, volume, temperature, media, and etc. This way, variation between cases and apparatus can be minimized and consistency in outcome increased. 
large volumes will make mistakes less likely to affect the outcome. Commercial kits are rather similar in composition. There are basically four most used permeable cryoprotectants, namely DMCO, propandiol, ethylene glycol, and glycerol, and different types of sugars used as non-permeable cryoprotectants. They appear in different variations for different purposes. For example, glycerol is mostly used in kits for sperm freezing. Propandiol, in combination with DMCO or with ethylene glycol, are the main components of the kits for vitrification. All of them do the same job, drive dehydration and rehydration processes in the cells. Despite differences in pH buffers, supplements, and slight differences in terms of the protocols, all kits have happy users and can be optimized for individual laboratory settings. It worth pointing out that there is still no clear difference in favor of one or other of the cryoprotectants. I just want to stress the point that all the cryoprotectants can be toxic if used incorrectly. The warming step is one of the most important in the vitrification program. Rapid warming is crucial to avoid ice recrystallization that can be detrimental to embryo survival. The warming rate is determined by two parameters, volume and temperature of the frost warming solution that contains one mole extracellular cryoprotectant. The recommended volume for this step differs for different commercial kits and protocols and is usually between 0.5 to 4 milliliters. During this step, Intracellular cryoprotective agents are rapidly removed from the cells and diluted to prevent their cytotoxic effect. This first step is very similar in different commercial kits, but the next steps can be performed either at room temperature or at 37 degrees depending on the manufacturer. Just to give you a quick example, the Sage Warming Kit is designed to perform all steps at 37 degrees, which can simplify the handling of the procedure. Nowadays, millions of embryos are vitrified using different commercial kits. There are a lot of oversized embryos and tissues that have been frozen with the slow freezing technique, which are still stored in cryobanks around the world. Furthermore, many clinics still receive samples from other centers that were cryopreserved with different kits and protocols. In this case, the possibility of using a universal warming protocol can simplify the management of the warming procedure. In 2014, Ludovico Parmigiani and colleagues published a pilot study with encouraging results of a single universal warming protocol based on subsequent steps with 1 and 0.5 mole concentrations of extracellular cryoprotectin irrespective of the freezing protocol of human oocytes. So the use of this universal protocol on embryos and blastocysts could simplify laboratory protocols, staff training, and management of the warming procedure. In 2018, the same group from Italy published a study that assessed the clinical efficiency and efficiency of the universal warming protocol on vitrified embryos by analyzing the cryo survival and implantation rates. The study was performed in two parts. The first part, a prospective randomized control study was performed on 315 embryos at the blastocyst stage. Each embryo was first randomized for vitrification using two different vitrification kits, SAGE and KITAZATA. Then at warming, the embryos were randomly allocated either to KITAZATA or SAGE warming kits. The universal vitrification and warming procedures were performed for both commercial kits with slight changes. As you can see, Female mean age and survival rate were statistically comparable between the study groups. The blastocyst survival rate ranges from 98.4 to 99%. Implantation rates in different groups were comparable as well and ranged from 18 to 22.5%. The second part of the study, a retrospective observational study, was performed on 1,055 embryos vitrified at the cleavage stage, obtained from the patient's own eggs and from egg donation-derived embryos as well. All embryos were vitrified and warmed in various combinations between three different kits, 
Kitazat Sajan and House Kit. Here you can see the results of the retrospective longitudinal cohort study with egg donation derived embryos. All parameters in study groups like mean to male age, embryo survival, and implantation rates were comparable. Both of these studies support the safe and efficient use of the universal warming protocol. Let's discuss now the expectations, the education process, and keep your eyes for the vitrification process. So, what are we vitrifying and what should we expect? By implementing a new technique, we usually expect high outcomes. But to get consistent good results, we should be precise and follow very clear and very established rules. First of all, use only good quality embryos. Then, a standard operating procedure for vitrification should be implemented in the clinic to ensure that all small details are taken into consideration. All operators, regardless of experience, should follow the SOP. And finally, a learning curve should be implemented. When you implement a new technique in the lab, what can you expect result-wise and how you can manage these expectations? First of all, our expectations should be balanced and the results should be comparable with the fresh data. You cannot expect a 70% clinical pregnancy rate in vitrification cycles if the clinical pregnancy rate in fresh cycles is below 20%. Top labs are consistent and use large volumes of media. You can achieve benchmarks only when you optimize quality, experience, and consistency. And be realistic. For example, according to the Alpha Consensus Meeting on Cryopreservation KPIs and Benchmarks, the implantation rate of human vitrified oocytes may be 10 to 30% lower than in fresh cycles. So what can we expect regarding oocyte cryopreservation? According to the Alpha Consensus predicted values for survival, fertilization, embryo development, and implantation rates favor the vitrification technique over the freezing method. The implantation rate should be the same as for the comparable population of fresh embryos in the clinic, but as we already mentioned, may be lower. These KPIs could be affected by the caseload and by the experience. Anna Koba and colleagues observed differential survival rates among either donors or different stimulation cycles from the same donor after analyzing 40,000 vitrified oocytes and egg donation program in 2015, and 1.4% of cases were with zero survival rate. The Alpha Consensus came up with KPRS for embryo and blastocyst stage of development as well. The expected morphological survival rate to achieve competence and benchmarks are much higher in vitrification compared to slow freezing techniques. Overall, for the cleavage stage, it was the consensus that the benchmark for the rate of embryo development should be the same as for the comparable population of fresh embryos at the clinic, and the implantation rate should be no more than from 10 to 30 percent relatively lower than the comparable population of fresh embryos at the center. As for the blastocyst stage, cryo survival can be defined as at least 75% of cells perceived to be intact after thawing and warming. The proportion of thawed warmed blastocysts that re-expand within two hours was recommended as an extra KPI to evaluate the survival rate. Overall, for the blastocyst stage, it was the consensus that the benchmark of the rate of embryo development should be the same as for the comparable population of fresh embryos at the clinic, and the implantation rate should be no more than 10% relatively lower than the comparable population of fresh embryos at the center. But to achieve the competence level and be closer or even exceed the benchmark level in vitrification, you should be consistent in all steps of your procedure and carefully manage the main parameters that can affect your results. Temperature will affect the speed of the process. Normal distribution of equilibration time will be faster at hot labs at 28 to 30 degrees than at cold labs at 20 to 22 degrees. Usually protocols are adjusted to room temperature or to 37 degrees Celsius. As we already discussed, volumes are very important. 
larger volumes may reduce the effect of errors. Remember, when dealing with small volumes, you increase the risk of evaporation and increase the smallality in the solution. It's better to start with large volumes at the learning phase until satisfactory results are obtained. When we implement a new technique in the lab or train a new person, we need in-house quality control procedures to assess the learning process of trainer as well as to monitor and optimize the introduction of a new technique. There are various methods that can be used to determine whether a trainer has reached proficiency. For example, performing a recommended number of procedures under supervision or is the standard practice. Or a statistical tool designed to indicate when a process has reached a predefined level of performance can be used as well. According to the saw, beautification procedures appear to be easy to learn, even though the trainee was a beginner. The learning process was mostly limited by manipulation problems. Thus, the learning curve of beautification for skilled biologists is likely to be shorter, and the introduction of this technology in the laboratories should be easier. But despite this encouraging publication, continuous monitoring after proficiency is required to prevent a performance shift. Key performance indicators will help you to monitor ongoing performance. Let's talk about traceability and witnessing during the certification and warming process. As with every step of IVF procedures, correct identification of gametes and embryos during cryopreservation is very important. Proper labeling of the cryo device with special details such as full name, date of freeze, and a unique identification number is crucial for the traceability of the sample. Additional information due to the specific needs of the clinic or national guidelines are also applicable. Witnessing of each step of the procedure from gamete retrieval the placement of the sample into the cryocane assures you and the patient of safety during treatment cycles. Special attention should be paid to documentation of samples and storage for easy identification, especially when samples reach the legal storage limit. Of course, it's very important to identify the individual frozen embryo. It's paramount, especially for clinics utilizing genetic testing. The labels or barcodes hold the identity of individual embryos. You can see the example of the barcode used for the arrive witness system, including all necessary information. There are different types of labels to suit various cryo carriers like straws and vials. Because every cryopreserved embryo had its individual barcode, you can easily designate the embryo according to approved or no approved for transfer based on the genetic testing results. Of course, witness cannot automatically approve or reject the embryos based on results coming back from genetic labs. It will still be the responsibility of the lab to evaluate the genetics results and approve the embryos accordingly. If anyone after this attempts to thaw or transfer an embryo that hasn't been approved, the system will provide an audio visual alarm. Now we will discuss tips and tricks that can help you to improve results. First of all, let's point out some tips regarding post-biopsy blastocyst certification as it's one of the hot topics nowadays. There is still no clear evidence in terms of an optimal time for vitrification after trophic biopsy. Common practice suggests to do vitrification within 30 minutes. Most important is to start the notification process only after cell tubing is completed. It was shown that trophic biopsy by itself doesn't impair blastocyst post-warming survival and live birth rates. Finally, apply the same vitrification practice as standard practice, as per what has been vitrified in your lab. If the blastocyst has collapsed but you don't collapse for vitrification, allow it to re-expand. If the blastocyst has collapsed and you collapse prior to vitrification, vitrify before the embryo re-expands. There are many factors that should be taken into consideration to start successfully or to improve vitrification outcomes in your clinic. First of all, 
only good quality gametes and embryos should be selected for cryopreservation. You still can vitrify embryos with questionable quality, but do not expect the same outcomes as for good quality embryos. Be very careful with control of timing, temperature, osmolality, and pipetting. Evaluate time for equilibration as it may differ between labs and stages of embryo development. For example, it usually takes less time for day three embryos to equilibrate compared to expanded blastocysts. Load embryos on a carry in minimal volumes to support an appropriate cooling rate. Be really very careful with handling, transportation, and storage. Remember that the warming step is crucial and reveals the sum of all prior steps, of which each may be detrimental if mistakes occur. Most current efforts are aimed at achieving a very high cooling rate using open pulled straws. Publications often include some discussions of the possible contribution of the warming rate, but there were only a couple of experimental attempts to separate the relative importance of each step. Seki and Mazur, using the mouse model, showed the importance of the warming rate. In their experiments, the faster the warming rate, the better the survival rate. There are some tips to maintain appropriate conditions for the warming step. First of all, always keep the warming meter at 37 degrees Celsius and use a minimum of 0.5 milliliters. Secondly, it's better to pre-warm media and dish in advance. And finally, place the carrier from the liquid nitrogen into the warming solution as fast as possible. In summary, Vitrification is a highly efficient technique for all stages of human embryo preimplantation development from oocytes to blastocysts. Oocyte and embryo quality play a crucial role in the survival rate and outcomes of vitrification protocols. A universal warming procedure proposed by Ludovico Parmigiani and colleagues can be followed regardless of the vitrification media. The warming step is as crucial as the vitrification step. Warming rate, temperature, and volume can affect the results. Traceability and witnessing are essential and secure the success of the cryopreservation program. Initial training and ongoing competency evaluation are essential using objective KPIs. And is with any technique, the cryopreservation protocol needs to be standardized for each individual lab. Thank you for your attention.